biggest question of all, in my opinion, is the first question I will ask you today, and it is the following. Who are you? Sure. Um, well, I guess professionally speaking, I'm the founder of Cinco Medicos, which is a healing center in Peru and Vermont that offers private sessions, couples journeys, small group facilities and uh, ceremonies and uh, creative retreats for leaders, artists, entrepreneurs. Uh, I've also facilitated for Soul Roots retreats in Florida, and I will be partnering with Rootstock retreats later this summer as well. And in terms of psychedelic experience, uh, I have more than 15 years of experience with the traditional psychedelics like LSD and MDMA, as well as healing plants like Wachuma or San Pedro, ayahuasca, mushrooms, morning glory, jungle tobacco, um, in the form of both rape and, and matacho, coca, sananga, medicinal mushrooms, herbs, things like that. Uh, I've also completed several master plant dietas in the Amazon, where I was initiated by Shipibo Maestro Don Enrique at the Incan Kenna Center. And that's where I studied ancient shamanic practices from the Makwa Lopez uh, lineage. We learned Icaros, we took lots of purgatives, uh, plant vapor baths and develop relationships with master plants like Noyrao, Trik Sanango, uh, Marusa, Chuchuwasi, Chichaki, Bogansana, and more. So I was also trained there to facilitate ayahuasca ceremonies, after which I've apprenticed with a, a shaman in the Sacred Valley of Peru, where I am right now, uh, working with the Sacred Cactus Wachuma. So um, that's a little bit of an overview of, of me right now, but I can also give you a, a history of how I got there. If you like. Yeah, well, I'd like to get into that, obviously, but that's a pretty good snapshot. And uh, I'm not sure if I caught your name in all that. A lot of people, they get into their story, but they fail to mention the, the convenient label for which uh, we can call you. Fair enough. My name is Jeremy Martin. Yeah. Uh, yep. yeah. That's that the, the conveniences tend to fall away, I guess, immersed in the world that you're in. I think the name is probably a little bit of a last consideration. <laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah. I, I tend to be a little bit of an anonymous, anonymous figure here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're steeped in psychedelic culture, uh, shamanic culture, which, uh, not mutually exclusive, right. You can be, uh, a shaman without the use of plants from what I understand. So it's not like yeah, the two are completely bound together, right? They're, uh, separate disciplines. Um, and you've experienced a wide range of psychedelic substances yourself. So how did you come into this world? How did you come into the psychedelic world, the psychedelic culture that you're in now and sort of, you know, you, you listed a lot of different things in what order did you start? Did you start with shamanism and that led you to the plants or you know, what was the journey like for you? No, no. I mean, initially I had been taking psychedelics since I was like 18 or 19, mostly for social purposes, but I, I initially began working with plants and fungi for, for my own healing, you know? So years ago I was hospitalized for depression and suicidality. I was suffering from addiction, you know, in the form of alcohol and cannabis use disorder and I was having insomnia, panic attacks, chronic pain in my nervous system. I was really walking around like an 80 year old man with a cane, actually, just really at rock bottom. So I was desperate and I had, I had been looking for something. I had been going to physical therapists, doctors, getting MRIs, all that kind of thing, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Right. And uh, just wasn't satisfied. You know, I'd been spending years with a psychiatrist, a psychologist. And so when I finally just threw up my arms and felt really frustrated, I started working with plants. Uh, the first one being morning glory. Uh, and that was because I couldn't get my hands on any LSD. I, I was mostly just wanting to grieve the fact that I had lost my body. I, I couldn't use the body the way a 30 year old man should be able to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like this might be permanent. And there was an incredible amount of grief that I wanted to work through. Um, then after I worked with Morning Glory and, and healed a lot of that chronic pain, I started working with and growing my own mushrooms. Mm -hmm. which then as many people find invites you into the ayahuasca world. Um, 
that that is where I, I received visions that ayahuasca was calling to me, to my total surprise. Um, and so during both magic mushrooms and morning glory and ayahuasca, I had several very intense shamanic initiations, for lack of a better term, which changed me at a very, very profound, ineffable level. I, I can't really describe them to you, but it was very clear that this was my path. And so these invitations or awakenings uh, are really what inspired me to want to train and learn more about shamanic techniques from maestros, guides, facilitators, um, that kind of thing. So wow, as that's crazy. Working with these plants and, and training, I've slowly begun guiding and helping others to work with these sacraments as well, because I felt like I've healed myself for the most part, not that healing ever ends completely nothing, <laughs> and you can always go deeper, but you do reach a level of competence and, and confidence in your skills, work a relationship, working with these plants. And so I've done other things to, to also start supplementing um, this work. I've taken coursework in trauma-informed plant medicine facilitation. Before that, I was working at the Department of Mental Health, uh, guiding groups, people with mental illness, um, lacking housing, substance abuse, things like that. So I was kind of already in the world, more or less of healing, but mm -hmm. that's how it's melded with, with plant medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it seems like such a common motif. I mean, like in, in a lot of people's stories, right. It starts with some kind of personal crises and illness tends to be the most common one. I mean, it's my wife's story. It's my friend Cress's story. It's so many people. They just, you know, the, the, like they have a model of what health is. And like you were saying, you went to all these physical therapists, you were trying to problem solve it from the outside, right. Externally, materially, whatever you want to say. And it wasn't until you went within yourself and found the root of all of these physical ailments that you were able to actually resolve the physical. And so, yeah, the, this whole physical crisis, this uh, body attacking itself, you know, like uh, autoimmune diseases and things like that. It seems to me that there's a strong correlation with internal causes. It's not something inherent to the body. It's something psychological or spiritual that causes then the body, the material uh, aspect of you to have symptoms, right? Absolutely. And I think a loss of the sense of self is really at the core of it. Trauma is being disconnected from others and ourselves, not knowing who we are. And it's also chronic stress, any kind of stimulus to the body that is serving the body that we aren't able to release and resolve. Uh, right. Release just good enough, right? It's half of it. I could write an angry song, but not actually resolve the anger behind that song, the root of it. And I think what a lot of traditional therapies, not to bash the Western model, is we don't really get to the root of the root. You know, you can spend thousands. There's no profit in that, Jeremy. There's no profit in that. If you get to the root, you actually solve the problem and then you can't keep cashing in on it. Not to be right. a conspiracy theorist, but it yeah. seems to be the case, right? There's a profit incentive that is inherently uh, contradictory to what healthcare or medicine should be. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, as soon as you introduce that profit, it's not really exactly. healthcare anymore. And it, it's occurred to me and, and many of my friends in this space that actually the, the incentives are totally reversed, right? Like mm -hmm. you should pay a doctor when you're healthy and not have to pay a doctor when when you're sick and, yeah. and that way the medical system wouldn't be incentivized to keep you sick, yeah. um, to keep you dependent on pharmaceuticals, something like that. I just find, I find it interesting that we haven't considered alternative paradigms because the current one is so profitable. Yeah. Well, and I think some, uh, many of us are considering alternative paradigms and this conversation is proof of that. I mean, the fact that there's uh, a person from Vermont, right? Is that where you're from? I'm from New Hampshire originally, okay. but yeah, I live in yeah, Vermont. that 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 corner of the world who's now sitting in Peru facilitating, you know, psychedelic experiences for groups of people or individuals is like a testament to the rejection of those models and paradigms that you describe, whether you call it Western medicine or to me, it's it's more inherent of like um, a, a purely materialist worldview. When you think like that, the physical, you know, physical universe is all there is, and there's nothing beyond that. And everything can be explained through 
the physical sphere, to me, that leads to the kind of problems that we're having right now. Absolutely. And, and some of the problems can be explained scientifically or, or traditionally as we have. Like my own coursework in psychology and addictions and, and mental health counseling has really helped me uh, in my work as an integration specialist, you know, yeah. both independently and for Mind Leap Health and helping folks to prepare for their psychedelic experiences and helping them to actually integrate them afterwards because they have changed so much and nobody else has really changed as transformationally um, mm -hmm. is, a, is a big part. And so I've learned a lot from psychology, a lot from modern medicine, but it really just seems to be, like you're saying, just a small part. It's missing, missing Eastern mysticism. It's yeah. missing shamanic plants. It's missing community, right? Like you know, we heal through relationships and Absolutely. we don't see that in, in our Western uh, world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense to me uh, that psychology would assist you and be a useful uh, tool for you in the work that you do. Because I mean, like to me, you know, psychology, spirituality, philosophy, these are all kind of one discipline that we've uh, divided into three parts. Because to me, you're dealing with the inner, anything that goes uh, into the inner dimension, um, the mind, you know, the psyche, anything that deals with those, the, the sort of subjective nature of experience, the mechanisms behind it, you're, you're dealing with the same area, right? You're dealing with the same sphere of, of, um, of experience, essentially. And so psychology gives you one model and one approach. And for me, uh, stoic philosophy and cognitive behavioral therapy were a big part initially of my journey, like uh, knowing that I could actually influence my own thoughts and that doing so would change my experience of the world and shift my, you know, shifting my perspective would shift my experience. That was a revolutionary insight for me that I, it's still to this day is a part of who I am. And I, I use it all the time to reframe situations or, you know, reframe interactions with people and look at things differently and experience them differently. So the psychology is, is a huge aspect of it, but in terms of conceptualizing versus experiencing. And I think that's where psychedelics come in, right? They allow you to experience what psychologists and philosophers talk about and intellectualize. Right. And, and it gets to the top down versus bottom up approach. I I've, I've learned a lot about the body. I worked at UCSF's uh, emotion health and psychophysiology lab, conducting studies on the human nervous system, biofeedback, polyvagal theory. Yep. And that has been instrumental in my own breath work with which I've also brought into the plant medicine space. And, and so it's interesting to see how our prior experience can actually help us, you know, can supplement the experience, but it's not sufficient, right? It, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Yeah. Wow. I love your approach, man. It's like, cause it's holistic. You're taking everything into consideration and you're not saying like, oh no, this isn't no, 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 I can't. Like you're leaning on everything that's available to you to help people heal. And psychedelics is like obviously a central tool or uh, instrument in your, in your methods, but it's not the only thing. I mean, you've got a very diverse sort of uh, approach here. Yeah. It, it needs to be a rich palette of colors because otherwise you're just painting in red, you know, <laughs> and like, I've seen a lot of people who have used psychedelics a lot and received absolutely no healing. They, they just go from one peak experience to the next. And that to me is an immediate red flag mm -hmm. where like you need these other modalities in order to, to get holistic healing. Um, and I see the conversations that I have as sort of a second ceremony after the ceremony has ended, you know, where people are like, wow, that was so grounding. I'm so grateful for for the way that we've talked about this and that talk therapy, ecotherapy, all of it is, is essential in my opinion. Yeah. So he, here's where I, where I could learn. Well, I can learn everywhere, obviously, but here's where I would like to learn from you is in the integration and, and the conversations that you're describing, because I, I try, you know, I don't try, I have those types of conversations as well. I do like a, um, like a consultation, let's say, like I talk to the person and, and get to know them for a bit. Then we do the ceremony or the ritual. And then I have like the follow-up and people always ask me, 
in podcasts or in those situations, how do you integrate, right? Because I always talk about the importance of integration and making sure that whatever happens during the experience, you take it with you and you it becomes a part of you. It's not something that you just experience and dismiss and move on from. I know how I do it. And I suggest, you know, I give people some ideas that way. So what kind of conversations do you have afterwards to kind of facilitate that? And what kind of tools do you give people for integration? That's a great question. It really depends on a lot of different factors I've, I've found. Um, the, the biggest one that I lean on is spending more time with the individual, you know, getting to know them really well in the preparation phase, understanding their trauma history, understanding where they are right now in life so that I can meet them in ceremony at that point too. And the other thing is having multiple ceremonies. Um, I, I, I don't think that having one or two ceremonies is really going to get you anywhere, even three um, perhaps. And so having space between those ceremonies to hold integration circles or one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, leaving a lot of time for rest and reflection so that the experience is slower and not too overwhelming for someone. Trauma is too much, too soon, too fast, right? And so the antidote in my, my mind is to slow things down, mm. to not overwhelm, to allow the valve to open, right? And then close it and then to open and then close it. And it's like, we don't have to get you know, 34 years of trauma, if you're a Marine or a firefighter or something like that, all out in one day. The fire hose. You don't need the fire hose. Yes, I agree. And, and it can be re-traumatizing. I've yes. seen that too. Um, and, and that's not what at least I'm going for in, in my work. Um, well, it seems like you don't need a lot if you're going in with intention and a true earnest desire to heal and grow or whatever your desire is, whatever your intention is. It seems like the dosage is... Just, it's just the, the, the oil that greases the gears. It's not like the actual work is the intention and the willingness to go in. And that just kind of facilitates it. Yeah. And there, there are certain plants and mushrooms that I, I think are easier to integrate than others as well. So it really depends on the individual's needs, right? Yep. Like if you're not mature enough for ayahuasca, well, then, you know, we'll, we'll determine that during the screening process, during yep. preparation, whether that's the right medicine for your needs. Uh, maybe something gentler like mushrooms or wachuma would be would be necessary. Uh, not to say that those medicines are gentle at high doses, but <laughs> um, certainly doesn't sound like it. Like, um, and but but to answer your your core question is like preparation and the the ceremony experience actually informs the integration period. So if, if someone feels like they know me really well, if they feel like they've spent a lot of time in ceremony with me and had enough rest and released and resolved over a longer period of time, the medicine actually becomes more of a lifestyle rather than something that you just go and do and then come back to your, your normal life. And you're like, okay, I just flew a spaceship and now I've landed. What the hell is that all about? Yeah. <laughs> and so as a result of it being more of a lifestyle, integration is naturally not as difficult. Yeah. Um, and 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 helping to also hold that container, right? It's like you have the ceremonial container, but you also have the integrative container where it's like you make sure that people have a good support community. That's essential. Um, many people, especially with mental health disorders, tend to have a lot of difficulty without any support afterwards. And so if they have an integration specialist, they have a therapist, they have work that they want to go back to, or at least a plan, and they have friends that are like-minded and, and will understand or at least try to understand their experience, I, I, I think that's a recipe for success rather right. than people getting lost and confused as is definitely possible for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I've seen it. And not a lot, thankfully. Whoops. Not a lot, thankfully, but I've definitely experienced that and seen that. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, you're just, yeah, you're just really driving home the point that, uh, some people are ill-equipped to do this work and you actually need a lot of training and a lot of uh, study. And it's not enough to just be on your own healing journey and think that you can kind of guide people along. It's like you, you really have to study this stuff and become an expert in it 
in order to do it, I think the confidently, right. I mean, because there's so many possibilities with people, different interactions. I'm not even talking about like overdoses. I just mean like a person, you know, traumas can come up during a session. And if you're not well equipped to deal with that, like, like you said, it could re-traumatize the person. So there's a lot of like, yeah, there's a lot of risk there. And there's a lot of ownership for a person like yourself, who's, who's guiding people. There is. And, and it's like, there are so many things that could go awry during a ceremony if you don't have that background and experience. Like if you as a facilitator drink too much medicine and aren't able to hold proper space and you go into your own process because you haven't been sat with the medicine enough, yeah, um, that's a huge problem for the participant. They might as well just do that in their bedroom. <laughs> um, you know, and I would not want like, that experience. <laughs> like, you're, you're supposed to be there for them if, yeah. they're, if they're going through something. And I, I have watched facilitators not facilitate properly. Um, and so I've heard that. that's a pretty common situation, right? I mean, because, because of the gray zone, like the fact that it's not fully legal and it's done kind of in a shady way, there's more potential there for abuse and corruption, right? Right. And, and also like you're, you're hinting at, like the profit motive, just because you're in a different industry doesn't go mm-hmm. away. Right. Like, people who are a little bit more business minded and and looking for a lucrative way of living that they're not i mean you need to make money but that's not why you do it right Mm -hmm. like so uh i i think business sometimes get gets in the way as well um and also rushing into thinking yeah i'm ready to do this when uh the more humble facilitators will realize like i'm i'm not there yet yeah. Um, or I need to enter this slowly. I, I, the best healers, in my opinion, are, are those that take a long time to, to get to where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it seems like a prerequisite or one condition of being a healer is that you are healing yourself or have done a lot of healing on yourself as well. Right. I mean, right. a lot of, um, <laughs> I think a lot of therapists, the problem is they're, they're, they're dealing with their own issues and they have not resolved. And so they're going over and trying to help people, but broken people break people, you know, that's kind of the pattern. So it's like, if you're a broken person and you're trying to help people, your help is going to sometimes come out like a hammer, <laughs> you know? And, and also spiritual hygiene, you know, is, is a big part of the maintenance. So you can pick up a lot of stuff from participants, energies, just wit- witnessing people's traumas can be traumatizing over, over time. Yeah. Uh, Especially, you know, people come into this work very sick, like me, incredibly desperate, right? It's like their last resort. And so they're coming at a time of intense need. And if you're there, not just around one person, but multiple people like that, over time, it can really take a a toll, not just on your body, but your psyche as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can take some of that energy on, right? And then it will have an effect on you. Um, I want to circle back and talk a little bit more about your healing journey and how it started. And, you know, so you, you started with morning glory. You said, I'm not even really familiar with that one. So what's the, what's morning glory? How do you get it? What does it do? Well, it is technically a schedule three substance in the United States. Um, and that, that whole campaign started with the DEA and the whole sixties um, thing and uh, but you can find it widely in any garden during the spring summer fall months in the united states and you just pluck it from garden trellises what happens is every morning the the morning glory flower blooms and then it closes up if it gets pollinated it will become a seed pod and then at the end of the season it will kind of dry into this crisp little husk or seed pod in which five to ten seeds are available so you can just pluck the pod and then find the seeds within there. You can microdose morning glory five to 20 seeds, 20 to 50 seeds is sort of a light to moderate psychedelic dose and 50 to 100 is a pretty hefty moderate to um, you know intense dose but it depends on the variety it depends on you know the flower that you're working with and um, so you can use it for a lot. Um, I, I found it to be very helpful for my chronic pain, but I, I also noticed that it could be helpful for obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, 
um, childhood trauma, developmental trauma, um, and just a host of other other things like depression um, and even addictions for that wow. matter. It so is, a, is the effect, oh, sorry, go ahead. It is a purgative, I was gonna say. So you don't always purge, but uh, you, you can go out the North or the South Pole, depending on how much you take. Um, you know, and I have purged on morning glory and it, it, it does clean you out in that way as well. Yeah. Which is also a good thing. I, I imagine, right. I mean, part of the purg purgative thing with ayahuasca, you know, I've heard stories of people, you know, pooping themselves and stuff in a circle with others that doesn't appeal to me, but you know, in private, obviously if that, that, that happens, I think it's good for things to come out, right. Both, uh, physically and metaphorically. So, I think there's yeah. a correlation there, but uh, yeah. So were, did you start off microdosing it or did you, were you, how were you using it in the beginning of your healing journey where it was giving you relief of your physical symptoms? Yeah, I was, I was starting to just experiment safely, you know, start low, go slow, and you can always take more you can yeah. <laughs> kind of approach. Yeah. Good um, philosophy. I, I worked my way up and, and worked with my own body. Um, I, I would never recommend anybody a certain dose before no. start, starting low. Um, but yeah, I, and then I eventually started taking like massive doses. Um, you know, I guess what Terrence McKenna might call a heroic dose of, yeah. of glory. And at that point it becomes an intensely visionary plan. Um, I mean, the Aztecs and, and the Mesoamerican cultures that use morning glory sacramentally or shamanically, um, you know, they used to commune with the gods. They used to actually go to other worlds. And um, so it is a visionary plant um, when used in a ceremonial context. And that is very important, mm -hmm. I would say. I've, I've talked to many <laughs> white people like myself who have actually felt almost nothing uh, taking morning glory. And right. I, my intuition or suspicion is that it's because they haven't used it in a ceremonial context and the plants know that. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about the dose and the substance being secondary to the intention and the inner state of the person going into the experience. Right. And okay. yeah, it's interesting because I noticed that like, I, so I, I tried psychedelics when I was younger, right. In my like early twenties and stuff. And I was like, all right, it was cool. Whatever. I didn't do it for a very long time. Then I embarked on a spiritual path and I began to have some of these insights about, you know, the way you view the world and how that changes your experience. And I started doing work on myself without psychedelics, just, well, I guess with cannabis, which is a psychedelic, I think to, to some extent, but aside from psychedelic or from cannabis, I was mostly just doing the work with spiritual practices, meditation, those types of things. And then in the last couple of years, I've come back to psychedelics and it's like, holy shit, this is a new ball game now. Cause it's like, I have a lay of the land. Like if psychedelics throw you into the inner world or they project the inner world outwardly, when I was younger, I had no idea what the hell was going on, but now I actually have some foothold in that realm. And so it's changed my relationship to psychedelics to the point where a microdose is like, whoa, I'm tapped in, baby. It's like a small, small amount, but because there's intention behind it and because I'm aligned in a certain way, it's like, whoa, was that a microdose? <laughs> I'm feeling alive right now, you know? So it's the inner work and the, um, preparation that way i think that has the most impact on the psychedelic experience and yeah it's it's crazy that you just kind of validated that a little bit with your your story so thanks for that <laughs> no problem and and the the shaman i'm working with right now he drinks very little medicine um i mean partly so that he can hold space but also because he's just become so sensitive to it and that happens in ayahuasca with chuma and many other medicines so it's like where your tolerance you it decreases with time Exactly. And, and you also just understand, like you're pointing to the nature of the mirror that you're looking into. You don't need this huge mirror, you know, just a small pocket mirror is fine. Right. Yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Whoa, that's a little too bright guys. <laughs> I don't need that. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. So have you, you said you've supplemented uh, your practice with psycho psychology and things like that. Have you uh, found, or do you identify with any particular spiritual path at all? Like, you know, Christianity, or uh, do you have any attachment to anything like that? Or is that part of your system? No, I mean, I, I guess I was raised Jewish, um, but I, and I really en enjoyed the the stories uh, behind that. But I never really identified with that on a spiritual level. 
Um, my own spirituality, I guess, is actually closer to Buddhism mm -hmm. than anything else and meditative yogic practices. Um, spending time in nature is, is spiritual for me. I love to hike. I love just sitting in a meadow or, or being in the mountains or the jungle. Um, that, that to me is like perhaps the most spiritual thing I've ever done. Yeah. Uh, good for you. Yeah. I mean, uh, that is spiritual as far as I'm concerned. You don't need to identify with any particular path. I was just curious as to your uh, upbringing because a lot of people um, are brought up in religion and then they have kind of this like, um, you know, uh, pendulum effect where they're like, oh, you know, anti-religious or anti-theists or whatever. So just curious to see if you had anything like that going on. Yeah, I was atheist for a little while. And, and I think part of that nihilistic approach is is more just a symptom of trauma that I was carrying at the time, mm -hmm. um, feeling disconnected from myself, others, and God or spirit. Um, and so as, as I walked the path and read about Taoism and other approaches of, of living in flow um, and started to try to embody that myself with, with a lot of time, I think I started to identify more with the Eastern um, yeah. religions and, and practices. Yeah, and your naturalist bent would, would fit right in with Taoism, right? I mean, it's a, basically the Tao Te Ching is an appeal to live in accordance with nature, right? To find uh, the flow of nature as you described it and to go with it instead of against it as human civilization seems determined to do, go against the flow, go against the Tao. <laughs> How's that working for us? <laughs> Woo! I don't know. Uh, it depends who you ask, but I don't think it's going very well from my point of view. Yeah, same. same. Yeah. Well, you're doing some pretty amazing work down there. So you do. Uh, you said you split your time between Peru and Vermont. So that's an interesting sort of uh, dichotomy for you. Is it culture shock every time you go from one to the other, or are you used to that flow now? That's a good question. Not really. I mean, I I've spent so much time in Latin America. I've been to like. I don't know, 15 countries and spent years of my life in Latin America. So coming here is kind of just like, oh, you know, coming home, my second home here yeah. in Latin America. Um, and uh, I, I particularly love Peru. I've spent five of the last 12 months in Peru here. Um, but also like, you know, I'm American. So I, I, I have friends at home. I realize that our culture is in need of deep, deep healing. Mm. And not everybody can just fly to Peru willy nilly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I want to be able to bring my divine talents and, and this magical medicine home to people who, who really need it. And there are lots of people who need it. So. Yeah. In some ways, the Western world, the so-called developed world is the most traumatized of all. And I think one of the biggest traumas that we have, and I don't know if this is your case, but many of us have it way too easy. There's no struggle. There's no challenge. There's no uh, direction or meaning. Everything is available. Everything is instant gratification. And you get this, um, what Viktor Frankl called the existential vacuum, where you, you're, you're physically at the best you've ever been. Medicine will keep you alive for the longest. Life is good. You have access to all these things. And yet none of it means anything. And it's empty and there's no direction and why bother? And that you described nihilism. So was that sort of your experience up until you started to get into the medicine and, and all that stuff? Or was that ever part of your sort of, you know, nihilism? Yeah, I think, I think meaninglessness, it, it, diseases of despair is the phrase, right? Like depression, anxiety, addictions, they, they're all just different manifestations of, of this existential ennui. Um, which is a light version of it. Some people feel so much nihilism that it leads them to, to suicide. And mm -hmm. that's where I was. And even you mentioned, you know, great physical health. Like I was a triathlete before I had chronic pain. So I was running 10 miles a day, swimming three miles a day, biking 50 miles. And like, I was in fantastic physical shape, but was I actually on a soul level content or fulfilled? Uh, no, actually. Clearly, training, yeah. But it, training for a triathlon was run, literally running away from, <laughs> from my problems. And um, I didn't realize that, that, you know, I think what a lot of people don't understand is 
these are such unconscious programs. I was, I was playing out a script I had learned in childhood and didn't even know was a script because it was so conditioned. And so I think the modern ailment that we have in the West is that we don't know how traumatized we are. We just literally don't have awareness. And so how can you heal what you don't know exists? Wow. Okay. And, and so oftentimes what we see is, is stories like mine and, and the ones that you shared is that people, it, it has to come to such a point of crisis and um, to wake you up, you have to be walking with a cane. You have to have been hospitalized. You have to have been an alcoholic for, for these things to be like, dude, your life is a mess right now. And, uh, and it's sad that it has to get to that point. But I think that is uh, a core symptom of trauma because you're so disconnected from yourself and who you are. Yeah, you've mentioned that a few times. Can you elaborate on that disconnected from yourself? What, what does that mean? How, how do you describe that? It can mean a lot of things, but um, I think it's playing a role or being a version of, of yourself that is not true to, 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 to who you feel you really are, who right. you know deeply, deeply, deeply uh, you are. And I'm reminded of a, a model. Have you heard of the, the drama triangle at all? Uh, I don't think so. It, it was a model proposed by a, a doctor, just an idea uh, that especially in dysfunctional families or any relationships for that matter, we tend to get in these drama triangles in which we play three predominant roles. Uh, one of which is the perpetrator or abuser. Another is the victim of that abuse. And the other one is the rescuer, you know, mm. someone who tries to save the victim. And these roles are dynamic, actually. They can switch over time depending on the scene, right? Right, so, the context of the situation, yeah. You either accept or reject the role uh, of perpetrator, victim, or rescuer. In my case, I, I tended to be the victim or, or the rescuer, you know, the family diplomat, the mascot, or, or I took the abuse myself. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for example, my parents might have been the perpetrator or the victim and they, and so we all play these roles and in the drama triangle, you're not who, who you actually are. You right. aren't your self-realized authentic self because we're not born, you know, playing these roles. Nobody's born an abuser. Nobody's born to save other people or to be, or to play the victim. But as we learn and become more conditioned to these um, types of roles, we think that's who we are. Mm. We think that we're the victim. And so we always play the victim uh, yeah. or we always want to save people if they um, are, are experiencing a, a tough time. And I see that in my own medicine work too, you know, like little glimmerings of, of the, the, the rescuer. Yeah, yeah. But the key point of, of mentioning this model is that once you step out of the drama triangle, then you can be your real true self. Right. right. Then you can actually know what you enjoy. You can be in authentic relationships where you're not just pretending to be someone else or trying to please other people. Um, so it can mean a lot to, you know, depending on, on that, that dude, that was a, a wonderful explanation and bringing in that uh, drama triangle model. I'd never heard of that before, but man, does it ever ring true? And just the <laughs> yeah. whole, I mean, you, again, like it's, I love these conversations because I always seem to find people that it's just huge confirmation bias. <laughs> like what you're, you're, what you're describing the story. And when you believe in the story, you'll never question it because why would you question something that you already know? It's this right. ultimate trap, right? And we all have this story. And, um, you know, some people are like, ah, not me. I have no story. I'm enlightened. It's like, that's their story. They're the enlightened dude who has no story, right? That's his story. He's telling him everybody, you can't get away from it. So what you said is exactly right. Everybody has a story. All you can do is step outside of your story and become the author, <laughs> right? If you're in the story, you're just a helpless victim, savior, whatever. You name the archetype. There's many of them. And that drama triangle is a wonderful example of that. But if you step outside of the story, you realize, ah, okay, I get to decide what my role is. I get to decide what the story is even, right? Which is kind of this whole idea of changing your perspective and looking at things differently. 
that that can change the situation from you being a victim to you being the perpetrator. You can suddenly see, oh, wait a second. I'm not just this like little victim here. I'm playing a part in this. I have a part in this play. I have a role to play and I can change it. Right. So, man, that's crazy. Did you come to this stuff through psychedelics? Like th- this sort of awareness of like your own programming, that all of this stuff, or was it kind of like, did that help to really cement it for you? Because I feel like a lot of people need uh, something drastic because like you said, it's a trap, right? You, if you're not going to question if you think you already know. So does it take like hitting rock bottom or psychedelics to really break people out of these patterns in your opinion? Um, I think again, it depends on the person I, I've, I've found that when I break out of certain programming, it helps me learn about other things. Like when I realized I was a codependent child, I started reading a lot about codependency and narcissism Mm -hmm. and the patterns therein. And that brought me to things like the drama triangle that brought me to to new understandings and models, frameworks of, you know, how I was operating uh, often on an unconscious level. And I think if psychedelics are an expansion of consciousness, that, that is inevitable, right? And so some, some people are already expanding their consciousness as they prepare for these experiences. Mm-hmm. And then it further expands upon the psychedelic experience. And then they continue to learn more and more about themselves and, and, and the world around them. And it, it just, it never ends, right? It just gets bigger and bigger. And it's like this Ouroboros or, or Taurus, like feeding back on itself, but, but expanding like the universe. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. We're such complicated creatures, aren't we? Right. And like, you also start to see, okay, take the drama triangle, for example, all the sub roles, like, oh yeah, I'm also a perfectionist. Mm. And like, where does that come from? And you start asking all of these look within type questions about like, oh, okay, well, I went to private school and of course I'm a perfectionist because that's so much conditioning and I had to be this kind of person. Yeah. Um, in order to survive. And uh, you start to just see your life through a completely different lens, which for me and for a lot of people can be quite destabilizing. And so circling back to integration, I think that earth shattering, paradigm shattering uh, experience can really rock people if they're not ready for it, both on a maturity level and also just not having the support of people who have also been rocked before yeah and also seen their their world completely disappear and realize, oh my <laughs> and the, God. their identity sometimes dissolve as well like yeah, yeah there's some yeah yeah i just had somebody somebody here a guest say my whole life's been a lie you know and when you come to the realization like that you don't want to be alone you want to be around someone who can listen to you work that out because yeah. that's a secondary process of coming to terms and accepting that yeah it has been a lot of a lie but now, now you realize that and that's okay yeah now what right and what can you learn from that lie because you know there's truth in every lie right i mean there's there's something there for you to mine and I, i'm sure right after an experience like that is not the time to be necessarily suggesting that to a person right. but it hopefully in hindsight you know it's like okay this wasn't wasted it might have been alive but it wasn't a waste there was something there wisdom to be mined and that way you won't be caught with that lie again right 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 exactly yeah that's crazy yeah so when you're in vermont how does it work uh, from a logistical or legal standpoint, do you have some kind of loophole or is it, is it all legal in that state, what you're doing or how, how does it work? Um, it's tricky. And, and I don't just do uh, work with plants and psychedelics. I, I also do herbal remedies and, um, you know, singing, breath work, yoga, just all, all these other things. But yeah. um, right now the legalization status is we're getting there, but we're not quite there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it is quite difficult, which is why I I spend a lot of my time in Peru. Um, And uh, obviously my hope, my prayer, my wish is is that it will become legal and that um, we are able to administer these things without 
having to be underground or, or anything like that. But currently, yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky. A gray zone, yeah. 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 Interestingly enough, I um I discovered this guy named Steve Urquhart. He was like a former Mormon like uh, politician who started like an entheogenic church. And he, I guess he uses the sort of religion loophole to get around the legality of it. So, you know, maybe that's another avenue. I think it's hard to separate psychedelics from spirituality for me. And again, maybe because I'm biased and I'm coming at it from the other way, you know, um, spirituality first into psychedelics versus I think a lot of people psychedelics breaks them open and then they are open to spirituality. Right. But I think the marriage of the two is, I mean, it goes back <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think we need it more than ever because it's, it's what's lacking today. Really yeah. what we're experiencing right now is a spiritual crisis and climate change and war and COVID. Those are just the symptoms, just like you, when you had your physical ailments, those were just symptoms of inner spiritual, psychological things. That's what the world is experiencing right now. So like bringing those experiences that you're doing over there to, to the Western world is, yeah, I hope we can get that done soon, man. Yeah. And if I have to become a minister to make it happen, <laughs> that's what I'm saying, dude, like just you have, and on top of that, you have the, uh, all of the credentials, Right. So not only would you be doing it, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, you've also got the psychotherapy, you've got all these other tools at your disposal. So yeah, just an idea for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish you'd come to Canada and set one of these up <laughs> for us. But yeah, I think that's the sort of the way to drive this is through the religious freedom in the US. I think that's the best avenue for psychedelics right now. Yeah, I have a friend in, in Arizona who just started her own church, and uh, I'm kind of waiting to see how that goes for her and seeing whether I can learn uh, through and, and by her. Um, it's, it's occurred to me, too, but it, it also doesn't seem totally necessary at, at this point. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully it won't be, right? Hopefully it just gets legalized and it's, it's you know, regulated and... But, you know, I, part of me worries that if it is legalized, like you said, then it'll become incentivized. It'll be a profit motive. And uh, you might lose a sort of, again, the spirituality as well, if it's all done in a cold sort of clinical setting with, you know, doctors and lab coats or whatever, you know, like I, for me, nature and psychedelics go hand in hand as well. As soon as I start to feel the medicine, I'm like, boom, outside time to go sit in the grass with my feet, you know, feet grounded and all that kind of stuff. Totally. And I, I did have an integration client who, who just did some ketamine therapy and it was in this musty basement with a, you know, a fake plant, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're hooking you up to this IV and it's like, Ugh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and he came back, but to your point, it's like, if there is a profit motive and you, you can go the legal route, people are waking up to the fact that like, that's not how they want to do it. That's yeah. not like, I don't want to, to sit in a hospital bed um, and, and have someone in a lab coat, you know, like hold my hand or something. This is not the experience. I, I want to be in, in Vermont. I want to be in a, a Maloka or TP or like yep. actually with someone who's studied from the ancient, you know, uh, wisdom traditions um, that, that has more of a um, earth-based approach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I hope it, I hope that whatever happens, it, that is a possibility as well. It's not kind of yeah. just, you have to go to your doctor and that's the only way to do it kind of thing. Cause again, to me, that would be uh, losing out on the essence of this. And it's, it's such yeah. a, like a spiritual experience, right? Yeah. Um, and a lot of these things do run through word of mouth and, and people are like, Oh, you've got to see this, this guy, this woman, you know, they're incredible to work with. And I, th I think those testimonials are, are really important, you know, because it establishes trust. It establishes the fact that there's a level of competency and respect and, and dignity um, and yeah, just reverence for it rather than, you know, a thousand bucks for ketamine or like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that doesn't sound like a good plan at all. Although I, I, from what I understand, some people have actually healed a lot from doing just that. And so, you know, these are powerful substances. I think it's just, it's a, there's a, you know, you can take the hard way and kind of like, I imagine that, well, from the sounds of it, maybe your way wasn't the hard way when you started, because you were very, uh, you were taking like a very good approach where you weren't like going crazy, right? You built up 
and but I think a lot of people when they do it on their own, they they might not take that approach, or they might just not have the education, right? And so, you know, doing it with a guide, with somebody who has experience and who's like you said, confident and competent, I think is is the way to go for for newbies for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and it is it is tough because there's a lot of information out there that how do you how do you know how to corroborate it, right? Like, yeah okay, I read this in a book, but I didn't live it myself, you know, or it, it's not a real experience. It's just a, the finger pointing at the moon. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah, and that's what, that's what something else that we were talking about earlier, right? The in- intellectualizing it versus the experience of it are very different things. And someone like yourself who has both is uniquely equipped to, to guide people along. So that's that's amazing. Yeah, it's like I, I believe in ethnopharmacology, but if you tell me like, oh, when you have dimethyltryptamine in an MAOI, like then it leads to this wild experience. Like that's not enough of an explanation for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good call. Yeah. Well, and even trying to describe some of those experiences is like, no, oh, like you just have, you have to experience it for yourself, really. And it's the same with that sort of paradigm shift, whether it's triggered by psychedelics or not. You can tell people, hey, you're, this is a story you're telling yourself. You can tell people that. You can try to illustrate it for them. But until they experience it, that step back from the triangle that you described or that step back from the story, it's like it's just words, right? You have to experience the shift yourself. Right. And I think a lot of people, you know, in their defense are telling stories or intellectualizing because trauma tends to do that to us, right? Like we we don't want to feel deal and heal so we move up to our minds and we try to be clever or the ego gets really sneaky and it's like oh maybe if you just know a lot that's enough you know (laughs) you'll feel worthy you'll feel yeah yeah yeah. talk about it you'll just heal your way through your thoughts (laughs) um you know, it obviously doesn't work that way, but no. but uh, I think I think there is a little bit of self sabotage um, due to fear of, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people literally say to me, "I'm I'm afraid of what will actually come up." I know that there's some dark stuff down yeah. there to look at, and I'm just scared shitless. Like, if I actually do open that Pandora's box, what'll happen? Um, and so it's a safer bet to read countless books and watch way too many documentaries um to feel like <laughs> kind of on the path but everybody's yeah. at where they're at you know of course yeah it's no judgment and in some ways i'm like that now and in, in ways that i don't even see yet and years down the line i'll be like oh remember when you thought you were wise ha ha ha, ha. Mm-hmm. you know <laughs> it's like yeah so it's it's a constant evolution but i do yeah i do find it interesting because when you experience the shift it's like so obvious. And you're like, oh, well, let me just explain it to my partner. And then she'll experience the shift. And it's like, no, that's not quite how it works. You know, like everybody, like you said, in their due time at their, at their own pace. And um, uh, yeah, for, for my wife, it was like migraines that helped her. And, you know, after years of me trying to rant and rave about these things that I was going through. It was like, you know, she experienced it. She was isolated with her thoughts and she finally was able to separate herself from her thoughts. And again, that step back, right. That she experienced the shift. And then it was like, as soon as she came out and started talking to me, I was like, ah, I could hear it in her voice. I could see it in her face. I was like, yes, you got it. Right. And, but then that's just the start. (laughs) That's like, you got it now carry on. Cause it's just like carry water, chop wood, baby. Nothing changes. You just got to carry on. Right. Oh man. Yeah. 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 That's good. I mean, it's, it's really nice to watch people's the beginning of their transformation because you know, like that's when the momentum has started and you can finally say, okay, I've done this you know, I can do it again. Um, and it's not so scary. It, it's, it becomes increasingly more comfortable. And that, that gets back to the lifestyle of like, you know, you don't just do this once you actually yeah. you know, kind of, kind of do it as maintenance as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, re- that's a really important because I think a lot of people, myself included with ayahuasca, I always thought it was like a one and done kind of thing. I was like, all you need, all you need is one ayahuasca session or, or journey and phew, 
it's life changing. You don't need to, you don't need to go back. And then I started learning more and um, uh, learned about this place in Costa Rica, I believe, where they do like, you go there and you have four sessions, four nights in a row. And I was like, holy shit, doing ayahuasca four nights in a row. I thought you only needed to do it once. And then like learning about these people's experiences night after night, it's like, holy crap. It's like a, a hero's journey. These people are going through deaths and rebirths. They're unearthing all these things. They're having archetypal experiences night after night. And it's like, wow. So yeah, for me, I, you know, what you're saying is spot on. Like it's, this isn't a one and done kind of thing. No. And I've, I've been wondering how to communicate that to folks, you know, because I think we, we want to take that magic pill. We, we want the magic bullet. Like we want to go to, the, we're so conditioned to go into the psychiatrist and like getting a prescription or like getting surgery or something and, and being like, okay, now that I've done that, I'm good. Right. And then all I have to do is just like, let my body rest from my, you know, appendectomy or something, but it doesn't, doesn't work that way with years of, conditioning years of trauma year, years of um just life you know just being a human it's going to take years to unlearn all that stuff too absolutely yeah patterns right breaking patterns creating new patterns it doesn't happen overnight it's a bunch of small decisions day after day and then over time you're like okay it's changing now but it, it's like yeah like you said it doesn't happen overnight and it, with one anything pill journey whatever yeah it kind of reminds me of farming in many ways it's like all right if you want to start a farm okay like <laughs> you're gonna to have to do a lot of work and it's gonna take years to to bear fruit um, yeah. you're gonna get better at it with each year you're gonna learn from your mistakes and you're gonna try different things you're gonna rotate crops you're gonna yeah. have some failed harvests um but you know the longer you do it the the more satisfaction and, and reward you get out of it. Yeah. Kudos. Yeah. That's, I think James Allen said, uh, a person's mind can be likened to a garden. It's going to bear fruit and right. And it's, it's going to bear something, but is it going to be weeds? <laughs> is it going to be, you know, sustenance? Uh, that's up to you. It's up to the gardener. So yeah, very well put. Well, I, I think this was a great chat, sir. And uh, I'm going to plug your website in the comment uh, or in the description below, obviously. And um, yeah, is there any parting words of advice that you can give to people who maybe maybe they're experienced psychonauts or maybe they're just curious about psychedelics? What would be your sort of parting words of advice for those folks? I would just um, suggest patience and humility. Um, realizing that it takes a lot of work, that it's going to take a lot of time. Um, and uh, although the ego is a wonderful tool that we can use to get what we want done or what we need, um, to just be very cognizant of, of your own ego uh, and, um, and thank the plants. Be very grateful for these medicines from mother nature for providing us with the ability to heal. That's what I would say. Yeah. Great closer. Appreciate your time, Jeremy. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Oliver. I appreciate you.